Thank you very much, Ryan. Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Oh, Father, just now, as we continue in this worship service, we ask, Lord, that you would help us all to turn our attention entirely to you. That we would leave off all other concerns and distractions and give you this time. We ask for you to have your way here in this place and with each heart. In Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Well, today, I've entitled the message, Show Me Your Way. And I want to start out by saying that when I got a call to come to Missouri to serve as a pastor, you know that I was from Michigan, right? And I found out that Missouri was the show me state. And I said to my dad, what does that mean? And he said, it means just what it says. It means, show me. It means that if, if you really mean it, then prove it. Show me, right? So I, I decided, as I was thinking about today's message, that I would entitle the message, show me your way. It is a message for us here I consider myself part Missourian now. <laughs> and so, uh, show me your way. I want to be shown God's way. Don't you? So, I'd like to start right out and get right into the scriptures. If you brought your Bible today, say amen. Amen. Very good. If you didn't, say, uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> all right. Psalm chapter, Psalm 77 is where we're going to start. Psalm 77, and when you're there, just say amen. Very good. Psalm 77 in verse 13. And it says, Your way, O God... Is where? In the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are a God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the people. And I'm going to stop right there. Your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. You see... There's something about the sanctuary message that our God wants us to understand. It has to deal with his way. And his way is providing a way for you and I to be saved. Because without his direct intervention, you and I are all doomed. That's really just plain and real, okay? We have to have the intervention of God. And he says that his way is in the sanctuary. He's got this way that he wants to show us. And I want to talk to you just a little bit about the sanctuary so we can explore this further. Okay? In Psalm 77, 13, there's what we just read. Your way is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? So let's consider the sanctuary system. And I know that some of you are very familiar with this, others not so much. What I do want to point out is whether you're familiar, whether you've gone over this lesson of, of the sanctuary many times, or whether you've never really heard it before, this message of the sanctuary is essential for every person in here. You must 
have an understanding of how God takes care of the sin problem that you and I have. So that we can have him take care of it for us. Amen? All right. So, <clears throat> you know that the sanctuary was set up as a place where God could uh, dwell with his people. Right? And you know that uh, people would bring in their lamb, their offering, their sin offering, and they would place their hands on the head of the lamb. And this would be not just any lamb. It would be what? This would be a spotless, a, a, a lamb without blemish. And this lamb is a perfectly innocent lamb, right? But the sinner would bring it in and he would lay his hands upon the head of the lamb and confess his sins. And then we know that the lamb would then have its throat sliced and the blood would be gathered collected in a bowl and then the priest would take the blood from the lamb into the most holy place excuse me into the holy place the first apartment we'll talk about that more in just a minute but what i want you to realize and, and some of you, again, are very familiar with this, but I, I want you to realize God was trying to give an object lesson that gave people a visual of being able to understand how he is working to take care of the sin problem that man has. That's what the sanctuary and its services are all about. It's an object lesson to help us to understand the plan of salvation. Okay? So the sanctuary is actually a type what I mean by that is it represents the real sanctuary. So where is the real sanctuary? The real one is in heaven. The one that the Lord pitched and not man, right? Okay, so you've got the sanctuary, and now everything about this earthly sanctuary is typical. It's a type of something that's real. Everything about it. From the, the building itself to its furnishings to the lamb that comes to the priest that serves, they're all types representing the true. So the lamb that comes and the lamb that is slain is actually a type. It's a representation of the real, which is the lamb of God, which we know is Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen? Okay. So we know that sacrifices were centered in the sanctuary from the time of Moses all the way until Christ. And redemption from sin is by the blood of Christ. In other words, the only way that you get to be forgiven is by the blood of Jesus Christ. The only chance or hope that you have for forgiveness is the blood of Jesus Christ. The only hope for anyone in here, whether you're young or old, whether you've been in the church all your life, or whether you just started, whether you've been caught in sin for a long time, or whether you've walked in paths of, paths of righteousness for many years, the only hope for you and I is the blood of Jesus Christ. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? So, we know that this lamb was a type representing Christ and his true sacrifice. Dying in your place. You know what's amazing? What, what the Bible actually says about this. It says that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become his righteousness. It's an exchange. He takes on your sin and guilt to impart to you his righteousness and begin to form in you a holy character. It's an amazing exchange, truly.
in the sanctuary system, we know that the priest would take the blood from the lamb, lamb that was slain into the holy place, the first apartment. And you know that the, uh, can you see my dot on the screen? Okay, right here you have a veil. And this veil actually stretches all the way across, separating the holy place from the most holy place. Okay, it's just pulled back for purpose of illustration so we can see both apartments here. But the, the priest would then take the blood into the holy place and sprinkle it there before the veil. How often did that take place? The priest taking the blood of the sacrifice into the holy place. How often did that take place? Every day. Every day. And then we understand that the earthly sanctuary was cleansed once a year on the Day of Atonement. And what we have here with the cleansing of the sanctuary, why does the sanctuary need to be cleansed again? Because of sin. The, the, actually, the, the confessed sin that went upon the Lamb, now the blood has been brought in. It's as though the guilt of the sins is accumulating, as it were, in the holy place. From all the people who've been bringing their sacrifices throughout the whole year. And then once a year, the high priest goes into the second apartment, the most holy place. And he does a sacrifice there. This sacrifice where, where he sprinkles blood um, uh, before the, you've got the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. When he is dealing, what sin is he dealing with there? Is this the exact same as the holy place, the daily sacrifices? What's different about this one? Why does it only happen once a year? What is, what is going on here? It is. It's the accumulated corporate sin that has accumulated through the year. Now he is dealing with the sins of all the people for a cleansing for them, right? To make a judgment in favor of the saints, amen? A judgment in favor of the saints. I like that. Who are the saints? God's people. St. Peggy right here. <laughs> Amen. To make a judgment in favor of the saints. So, this priest, this high priest, and only the high priest could do this, would go in, and he's an intercessor between man and God, right? He is a mediator. But remember, even the priest himself is a type of the truth. He's not your true priest. No earthly man is your true priest, amen? On the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment, your priest, the true priest, is working on your behalf. And we are talking about Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that the only way, I, I know I've already emphasized this, but it, I, it needs to be clearly understood. The only way for salvation is through Jesus Christ. I mean, even if you came to him 20 years ago, and since then, you have truly tried to stay the course with all your heart. You've never turned back and gone back another way. It's never still built on your merit. It's always based on the merits of Christ. If it ever becomes based on your merit, you're in trouble. So all the things about the earthly sanctuary are types that represent the true ministry of Jesus Christ. We know that the lamb of, that was the little woolly creature just represented the true lamb of God who was going to be sacrificed. We know that the sanctuary and all of its 
furnishings were actually representations of Christ and his work. And we know that even the priest himself is a representative of who the true priest is, is Jesus. So the whole thing, everything about the sanctuary service is about Jesus. I mean, even down to the veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place, which represents his flesh. Remember, because it was torn when he died, right? So what is this telling us? This is telling us that his way, remember how we started this, your way, O oh God, is where? In the sanctuary. And his way of handling our sin problem is Jesus Christ the righteous. He is God's gift to mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? So I want you to think about the fact that Jesus is persistently, consistently working for your salvation. Even now, as he is truly in the true sanctuary which the Lord pitched and not man. You know, I've heard so many times from, from people that it, it was all finished at the cross. It was all over at the cross. And my big question for that, if that's somebody's line of reasoning, is what are we still doing here then? If it was all finished at the cross, why are we still here 2,000 years later waiting for the culmination of these things? Because there was more than the sacrifice in the sanctuary system, wasn't there? It went past the sacrifice to into the holy place and then into the most holy place for the final work of atonement. And then when the high priest is done, then people are sealed. The judgment is made in favor of the saints for those who have put their trust in Christ and his provision. Amen? Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 read, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. In Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12, it says, But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained what kind of redemption? Eternal redemption. This isn't something that has to keep happening every year because it's not a type, it's the true. And Jesus is working to make atonement for you and I. And, you know, you might get tired of hearing me say this, but I hope that I say it enough that you own it in your mind and in your heart, and you're able to share it too. Atonement means at one meant. He has taken away the sin problem that separates us from him and brought us back at one with him. Right? Very important. Okay, friends, Jesus is trying to cleanse the hearts of his people so that they can be united with him for eternity. He has went to the greatest lengths to make sure that you get a shot to be in his kingdom and in his family forever. And he didn't even wait to see if you were going to accept that offer before he went all in. I want to share some more scripture with you. Are you still there in Psalm 77? All right. Let's look at verse 19. Psalm 77, verse 19 says, Your way was where? In the sea. 
Your path in the great waters and your footsteps were not known. What is he talking about? He's talking about when he delivered his people from the bondage of Egypt, and he brought them out, and he saved their lives. He parted the Red Sea, and they were able to walk across, right? So first of all, earlier in the chapter, it says your way is in the sanctuary. Now he's saying your way is in the sea. What's the difference here? Or or is there a difference? Or how do these things relate? Let me tell you something. When Moses and those Israelites, those Hebrews, were trapped, there was no way out. They were surely going to die. Pharaoh and all his armies were coming upon them, and the only thing that kept them from certain death was God opened up the Red Sea, and he made a miraculous way for his people to live, even though they were caught, and there was no chance they could save themselves. That's the point. There was no chance they could save themselves. Only God could deliver them. That's the point. That's why when we say your way is in the sanctuary, and it's also in the same psalm, your way is in the sea, he's pointing out the same thing. The only way you're going to be saved is by the direct intervention of God in saving you. Would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11? Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the faith chapter, right? Given an account of many different uh, faithful people who uh, have followed Christ and, and kept his way. And I just want to read verses 27 through 29. Hebrews chapter 11 beginning in verse 27. And uh, here we're talking about Moses, and it says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him, that is God, who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And by faith they passed through the Red Sea, As by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were what? Drowned. You know, it's interesting. The Egyptians were attempting to also pass through the Red Sea, weren't they? They were trying to do so. But what the difference was is that Moses and the Israelites did it by faith. They understood this is God Almighty who is doing this miracle for us. This is how we are getting out because of him who is watching over us, him who is delivering us, him who is affording us an opportunity to live. And while the Egyptians pursued, they're going through in their own efforts, trying to catch God's people, trying to take the same path, but it's through their own efforts, right? There's a lesson there. So, friends, as we consider the way of the Lord, I'd also like to look at a passage in uh, John chapter 14. So far, we've seen that his way is in the sanctuary, his way is in the sea. What we're looking at there is the miraculous intervention of Jesus in both cases, right? Now we're going to look to John chapter 14. The Gospel of John, chapter 14. When you're there, say amen. All right, very good. Beginning in verse 6. Actually, this is the only verse I'm going to read here. And Jesus said to him, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So here's what I want you to check out, man. What I want you to realize God says his way is in the sanctuary. We look at the sanctuary, we understand everything about the sanctuary is all about Jesus. God says his way is in the sea. We look at what happened with the sea, and it opens up miraculously. There's deliverance. God leads them out of there. Everything about that is the divine intervention of Jesus Christ delivering his people. Now we look at what Jesus says about himself, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but 
by me. And friends, we need to understand that today. That Jesus is the way. Will you turn back to Hebrews with me to chapter 10? Hebrews chapter 10. When you're there, say amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 19 through 25. Beginning in verse 19, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? The day of the return of Christ. Do we see the signs of the times? Do we know that the day of his return is approaching? Amen. And we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves uh, together, are we? We're supposed to gather together in meetings like this and encourage each other in the way. We're supposed to help each other to have faith together, to move forward according to that faith that we have in Jesus Christ, who is our salvation, who is our very life. Without Jesus, you have no life, no hope. In him, you have both hope and life. So what I really wanted to get across about us people who are influenced by this Missourian mentality of show me is that what we need to be shown is that it is his work, not ours, that brings about our salvation. You cannot earn it. And I want to show you one more thing before we move ahead. Two, actually, two passages. One is found in Matthew 20. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. If you're there, say amen. All right, Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 28. It says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? To serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is absolutely key, and it absolutely helps you to understand something that is very, very important. You see, it is not about what we need to do for him that counts. It is about what we need him to do for us. Do you understand? Don't take me wrong. I'm not saying that we don't need to be obedient. Of course we do. I'm not saying that we don't need to serve Christ. Of course we do. I, I'm, I'm saying that... The salvation message is not about what I need to do for him. It's about what I need him to do for me. That's why he said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I came to do for you something that you can't do for yourself. So, take a look with me at a passage that emphasizes this in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Gospel of John, chapter 13. When you're there, say amen. Uh, one more time, if you're there, say amen. Uh, very good. All right, beginning in verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from the, this world to the Father, 
Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper, from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. So I want to stop right there and say, Jesus is exemplifying coming to serve. And here's, here's his disciples who've been having discussions and debates lately about who's the greatest among them. Who's going to get to sit on the right hand of God and who's going to get to sit on the left? Jockeying for position. And here they are, all gathered in the room, and everyone thinking, boy, son, you know, when you're having you know, feasts like this and everything, it's the custom that everybody gets their feet washed, but who's going to wash the feet? Well, it ain't going to be me. I'm going to be the one sitting on the right hand. And pretty soon, Jesus stands up. And Jesus, I mean, you realize who he is? All things were made for him. And by him. And with, without him, nothing was made that was made. He made everything. He spoke and it was so. He's the almighty God of the universe. And he's stooping to wash the dirty feet of these disciples who have no clue about what it is he's really doing for them. And Peter's going, no, no, you'll never wash me. And Jesus makes it plain. You don't even have a part with me if I don't do this for you. This is what we need to understand, brothers and sisters. Jesus is trying to serve you. He wants to help you to become clean before him. He wants to fashion you and fit you for eternal life. And it's his work. This whole thing about foot washing, you know how Peter was zealous then. I mean, once he realized, well, if you don't wash my feet, I have no part with you, then, then wash me all. Wash my head, wash my hands, wash everything, right? And Jesus said, he who has already been bathed has no need. You know, many of us have been baptized by immersion. Amen? And ever since baptism, we have walked in utter perfection. Never flawed. Never erred. I wish it were so. We have stumbled along the way have we not at times maybe said or thought or did some things that we ought not to have maybe missed opportunities that we should have done something but we didn't right i think of it like this if after my baptism i went and 
got in the mud and wallowed all around in my sin by choice. I just wanted to waller in my sin. I need to be rebaptized. But there's a provision for when you're walking along the way and something distracts you and you stumble and you, oh, you step in the mud puddle. And you've fallen short of the glory of God. But you're back. You want to stay on the path that God has for you. The foot washing comes into play. It's as though it were a mini baptism. And God working with us in our errant ways through our daily lives. So it's a good opportunity for us to take advantage of. And it's not only an opportunity. I mean, I want to ask you, how many things is Christ our example in? He's our example in all things. Let's continue. I'm going to pick up in, uh, let's see, verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if what? If you do them. Jesus again, exemplifying service and then calling us to follow his example. We practice the ordinance of humility in this church. We go through a foot washing ceremony. And it's not because, like if Gary were to serve me, it's not because my feet are dirty because I stepped in a mud puddle out there. It's because we're following the example of Christ in Scripture. And we're giving God the opportunity to deal with us and cleanse us as we put faith in his provision. Now, let me ask you something. When someone is baptized, is it the water that cleansed them from sin? No. Neither is it the water in the foot washing that cleanses us from sin. Is the rite of baptism something that God commands us to do? Yes, to signify a death to self and living to Christ, right? Is the foot washing an example that he gave to us and called us to obey and, and do also? And it's symbolic, just like the baptism is symbolic, of cleansing us from our stumbling, staggering, wayward ways. And we all need his intervention, don't we? Amen. The bottom line of learning the ways of Christ is you have to understand it is all about Jesus and what he can do for you. It's not about what you can do for him. It's about what he can do for you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, at this time, we, we will uh, be separating for the ordinance of humility. Um, I need a little help with how we're situated. Can somebody make an announcement about that? Okay. Okay. What, what we've got is, uh, I think, the men in the main fellowship hall, is that correct? At the, the far end this way. Okay. And then the women are at that end, separated by the divider. Okay. In the fellowship hall downstairs. And then if you're unable to navigate the stairs or anything like that, we can, we can make provisions for you. There's no one who needs to go unserved. Okay. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, and just before we separate, we're going to have a prayer. I want to encourage you. If there's been, if you know that God is working with you and there's something that you need to let him have, 
You need to ask for forgiveness for. You need to surrender to him. You need to put your faith and trust in him. Now is the, a great time, a perfect opportunity to do so. Ask for his cleansing. Ask for healing. Receive from him forgiveness. Let him stand you upright and circumspectly so that you can walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for showing us your way. Your way is in the sanctuary. Your way is in the sea. Jesus is the way. We pray, Lord, that we will come to a real understanding of the fact that we need you to serve us so that we can be prepared for eternal life. Help us to accept the gift that you're trying to give to us so that you can cleanse us from all unrighteousness and transform us and restore your own image in us. May we seize this opportunity today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before you leave your seats, when we come back to our aisles, you know we'll be seated every other row. Is that correct? Are we doing this? Oh, okay then the only thing that we need to do is make sure then that the aisles are clear of like purses and stuff so that the ushers as they're going down to serve will not stumble. Or the contents of your purse come out. All right. Thank you. And we may go to our places. The foot washing ceremony. Felt funny about it, I guess, when I first came into the church. But now that I've come to an understanding about the way of Christ and my great need for him to serve me and fit me for eternal life, it's come to mean a lot to me. And I'd like to take, I, I'm, I'm thankful for that service, the ordinance of humility. And I'm thankful for what these emblems here represent. We have unleavened bread and unfermented wine. They are unleavened and unfermented because they represent the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And the leaven and the fermentation would represent sin. And in Christ there was no sin. Right? Right? He became sin who knew no sin, right? That we might become his righteousness. Him fitting us for eternity. Today, I hope that it's been plain and clear that Jesus continues to try to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And even in partaking of the communion service, it's interesting how he, he chose the bread and, and the wine to represent himself and that these are things that you must consume, that you must t take personally, that as you consume them, they actually become part of you. And that's his intention, is that you would come to an understanding of you need him. You need Jesus in you. Right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? Amen. At this time, I'm going to actually have Larry have a prayer excuse me over the bread and Larry just share what's on your heart brother as well as praying for the blessing over the bread please well this is a blessed experience we have to take the body of Jesus 
that's broken for us. I'm so thankful for that. Amen. Yes, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this service today. We're thankful Jesus went to Calvary's cross and died a cruel death that we might have this life. We're thankful for this broken body, this bread that represents his broken body. As we partake of this today, may we, may we not do it lightly. May we, may we do it realizing that the sacrifice was for us. Oh, we're so glad today that you love us so much. You gave yourself for us. And we want to be with you in your kingdom soon. So we pray that you bless us now and bless this bread, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As the emblems are, as the bread is being distributed, um, let us sing a verse from the old rugged cross. Jesus dying on that cross to pay for the likes of you and me. <laughs> How precious is that? He valued you and I so much and the thought of you and I being in his kingdom that he was not willing to live without us. He'd rather die than live without us. And that's exactly what he did. Died so that you and I can be there with him throughout all eternity. I got to tell you, I can't wait till one day I can look Jesus in the eye and thank him for what he's done for me. Wrap my arms around him. What a day that'll be. It seems we're close to having everyone served, and we didn't want to leave anyone unserved. It's important that we all partake of what Jesus is offering, amen? Again, we realize the bread is symbolic, but we put faith in what it's symbolic of, amen?
that's okay. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, it reads, And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. As you're taking that in, be mindful that the sacrifice that was made for you has been received as your own. This time, I'd like to turn attention to the wine. We know that but for the blood of Christ, none of us could have remission of sins. Right? Brother Mario, is there anything that you'd like to share or would you lead us in a prayer of blessing for the wine? What a thankful we should, each one of us, that we can be, uh, take part in this uh, uh, emblem. And uh, as Pastor says, we, uh, this um, juice, fruit juice, uh, is a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed in the Calvary cross. And by this, it also that is will cleanse that blood, cleanse us from all our sins. And this is a privilege that we can have this, be a part in this. And as Jesus says, that do this in remembrance of me. So that's why do it as part of his word. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this privilege that we can be a part in this uh, uh, symbol and the system that we can, uh, <coughs> that you allow us to do. And Lord, I pray that it will, it, uh, it will uh, take uh, each one of us and uh, to cleanse us from all un, uh, our sin. And may your word be true about each and every one of us here today. We thank you so much. We will remember this as you said to remember. Thank you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As the wine is being distributed, we can continue with another verse of the old rugged cross.
Before we partake of the blood represent the juice. I want to say something very, very plain. Sin is no small deal. Sin is such a big deal that it took the blood of Jesus to take care of the problem. We should never, ever esteem sin or wayward behavior lightly. We should recognize that we are not our own, that we've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. That we belong to him. We're the purchased possession. And by this precious blood of Christ, here represented in unfermented wine. You and I receive the remission of sins. Amazing. We should never take that lightly. Continuing to read from Matthew chapter 26 beginning in verse 27. It reads, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Friends, while communion is a solemn occasion as we consider the great price that's been paid for us, for our redemption, for our salvation, we should also recognize that in receiving Christ, we have the assurance of salvation. In receiving him, we can count on and put our trust in his provision for our redemption. We should leave this place today feeling blessed. We should leave this place feeling grateful for the intervention of Christ on our behalf. Amen? It is a beautiful thing that God has intervened in our lives to give us life as he has given us forgiveness. Praise his name. Amen? Amen? Praise his name. He's worthy to be praised. I'd like to close today's service by singing a special hymn. And uh, I'm not sure what number it is, Neil. Uh, could you tell me? Thank you. Number 108 in your hymnal. Um, this song should mean a lot to you if you've thought much about God's intervention in your situation. Amazing grace, amen? Shall we stand together as we sing it?
may be seated. I want to leave you with a word of encouragement today. Today we have put our, our trust in God. Amen? Amen? To cleanse us from our unrighteousness, to forgive us for our sins. Isn't that right? We look for him to help us all along the way to continue to serve us and to bring us safely into his kingdom. Isn't that right? And friends, may I now read in your hearing today. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. May the Lord be with us all.